Well, there's another uh, aspect too that when this film came out was during the Hillside Strangler era, and the Zodiac was still in the news. So the, this film actually appeared at the time that those killers were a real item, even though the werewolves <coughs> had been off screen for 20, 30 years. It's sort of a the the, uh, the, the, the right time. For, I mean, that's really made the film. Well, we real tried item. to we just tried to modernize what was a real, a considered kind of you know there are clips from the Wolfman. They, they, most famous werewolf movie in this picture, and well, on purpose for contrast purposes, and also because uh, we look, we grew up loving those movies, and we and they they had kind of fallen by the wayside, and we kind of wanted to bring back that kind of picture. So, I I've always found that when I work on something, I always try to plunder from the past because um, it still means a lot to me, and I think that going on in the future, a, a lot of filmmakers do that. Marty Scorsese does it. And, I mean, it, people who love movies can't help but quote from the movies that they love. Do you think that sense of nostalgia, you know, plays also in your, the way you make your movies? I mean, because, you know, I'm thinking of uh, some of your other films, too, and there's a sense of kind of the Norman Rockwell kind of layer to it, you know, this kind of beautiful suburban or, you know, loving kind of thing, but there's always that story behind it. Is that, is that a kind of common theme? And the well, way you I, try and write your stories. I don't know them. that it's a theme. I think it's just, I mean, I grew up in the suburbs. Spielberg and I make similar kinds of movies, but my <laughs> suburbs are different than his. I mean, I wouldn't want to live in that suburb where E.T. took place. I mean, jeez, I mean, there's no trees, for God's sake. Um, but uh, very, there's the kind, of, uh, the kind of use of nostalgia that I like to do is to undercut it. I mean, like, I like to have a little time, uh, Frank Capra, Capra kind of a town in Gremlins and then turn it upside down. And that's the whole idea behind Blue Velvet. I mean, it's, you know, you, you have what's going on under the surface, you know. There's a shot of Blue Velvet where there's a pretty lawn and the camera goes down and there's bugs and there's grubs and there's you know, dead birds. And, 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 and there's always something else going on under the <laughs> facade. But, but it's, it's fun to, to do the, the, the burbs and do a movie that's supposed to be about people living this placid life that, that actually uh, has a lot of undercurrent in it. And that's always appealed to me. Was it very difficult in um, shooting the um, werewolf sequences where they're transforming? The question is, was it very difficult to shoot the werewolf sequences yes. when they're transforming? And um, during the 80s, you know, what resources was available for you to make it appear so um, romantic-like or, you know, exciting what, to become a werewolf? Yeah, and, and what resources were there to make that effective in the Correct. making of it? Well, this was the comparative Stone Age, you know. I mean, this was so long time ago. And uh, we didn't have any of the resources that you have now. And one of our big um, uh, hopes at the beginning and how one of the ways we sold the movie to the distributor was we said we wanted to do a werewolf transformation in one shot. Uh, and we did a lot of tests, and we figured out how to kind of almost do it. But uh, I, I later, when CGI came in and I saw people actually do transformations in one shot, it was sort of like, eh. You know, I mean, it was okay once, and the Manimal on TV did it, and they, you know, it, it sort of got to be a cliche. And I, I and and looking back, I'm glad we didn't do it that way because editing is a big tool in making movies, and people's reactions make your special effects. You can have a great special effect, but if you cut to a reaction that doesn't work, then the audience doesn't buy it because they're invested in the characters, not the special effects. And in this case, the technology that we were using, which was fairly new. Um, was in developed, it was invented by Rick and developed by um, Rob for us and involved the use of fake heads and the use of, um, uh, what was it called, chinjo heads, I think they were called, and uh, they, it, 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 bladders and masks and, and all sorts of stuff like that. But, uh, but another key to it is the lighting. And although Rick Baker had a lot more money than Rob Bottin did on American Werewolf in London, his transformations, I think, are not quite as effective because they're very, very highly keyed lit. They're very bright. And you can see all the latex, and you can kind of see the mechanics. You can sort of see what's going on. We knew we didn't have, our stuff wasn't going to stand that kind of scrutiny. So we lit it, John lit it, uh, very darkly and artificially and, and, and artfully to hide uh, what we thought were going to be the uh, deficiencies. Um, and they were, and we shot it at different speeds. We would shoot it fast, we'd shoot it slow. We, we didn't. We just were experimenting. We didn't know what would look good. And sometimes the, me the mechanisms and the, and the faces would pop, and we'd go, "Oh, it's ruined!" Because our original idea was we wanted it all to be really smooth. But then we realized if we put a bone crunch on the pop, it looked like it was a bone realigning itself. And, and all of a sudden we had a whole different take on 
how it was going to work and what, how painful it was going to look. And so it was really a trial and error thing. And uh, it was, we really didn't have any money. Uh, like we had $50,000 for the special effects of this picture originally uh, on a budget of, of like a little over a million for the whole movie. And uh, what we had was Rob put a guy in a suit, a guy in a werewolf suit. Only he looked like a big bear because one of the tricks about making somebody look like a wolf is that they have to have this really skinny, impossibly skinny waist and these legs that you just can't put a person's legs into. It doesn't work. So we shot a bunch of stuff like that and it wasn't working. And we went back to the studio and we said, you know, if you just give us a little bit more money, we think we can fix this and we can think we can make it look okay. And they said, fine. Um, that means you don't get any percentages or whatever. I mean, they made some onerous deal that, you know, meant they would, they would make money forever and we'd make nothing. But, um, but nonetheless, we went back and we used some puppetry and some, uh, he built a, a whole fake werewolf. And, um, and by judicious cutting, we managed to make it look like it was a real wolf, which was something we never would have been able to do with a guy in a suit. Uh, so it was, um, it was pretty difficult, that part of the movie. But um, it was done very, very quickly and very fast and very cheap. And uh, considering, you know, what we had to work with, we were pretty happy the way it worked out. I, I think you, I remember you, you saying that when Spielberg saw this, he never realized you didn't see the whole werewolf at one time. It just because the, the, the legs were like, you know, sticks. And you never actually get to see the whole creature. And yet he never realized it after seeing the film, but that's, that's played. Well, you do, see, you do see it, but it's a stop motion. Uh, werewolf at the end of the picture. There's three of them, and it's a very brief shot. And the reason it's brief is because the stop motion, which is good, um, doesn't really match the movements of the of the live action uh, the, the stuff. And uh, in fact, there was a whole long scene in the barn with stop motion werewolves uh, catching fire and burning, which we shot and which was in the picture for a while. And we took it out to a preview. We showed it to some friends, and people came up and said, "Gee, where'd you get that shot of the uh, werewolves burning in the barn? What picture is that from?" And we realized, well, it's, it doesn't work. It doesn't look like it's part of our movie. So we had to drop it. And the, the poor guy who sweated for you know all those days trying to you know you know long it takes to do stop motion. I mean, he was really bereft. But it, it just it, it had to come out. It didn't work. Thank you. What was the significance of the smiley face? Oh, uh, what was the significance of the smiley face? I was wondering that myself. Well, it's funny. I just saw a trailer that had a smiley face in it, and there was a little logo that said smiley face copyright by you know I didn't I didn't know smiley faces were copyright well they certainly weren't then uh, it, you probably don't remember this era the way, the way we do but smiley faces were a virtual plague they were everywhere it was disgusting I mean you couldn't go anywhere without seeing these smiley faces and people had them as stickers they were all over the place and we thought what 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 more odious symbol could there be of our time than these smiley faces and so we used that <laughs>